Good morning and welcome to Rise Paradise Podcast. We are here with Dr. Sarah Mura. Uh, she's a geriatric psychiatrist. Welcome and good morning. Thank you, Moti. Thanks so much for having me here how, today. How, how are you? Doing well, doing yeah. well, yeah. That's good. We tried to get this podcast for a while now. I know. I'm right. glad we were finally able to connect and to come on over here. You've got a beautiful facility here. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'm sure this is going to be very informative for our audience, and uh, we'll try to make it also as fun for them, so it's not just uh, like it's not like they're in the lecture hall, you know. So, <laughs> but you know, uh, before we start, why don't you uh, quick introduction about yourself? What's your background? What you do? All this stuff, so people know because you never know. We'll, we'll if you're okay with it, we'll put your information. So if people need your help or anything, they can always reach out. Sure. So if you would like to share a little bit about you, and before we kind of dive into our main topics. Absolutely. So my name is Dr. Sarah Mora. Um, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, as you mentioned, and I got my training at UC Irvine uh, Medical School and did my residency in adult psychiatry at Yale. And then I came back here to LA, um, partly because my parents were saying they they wanted me here. <laughs> and they're like, you can't be that far away. Yeah, um, the East Coast, too far. Yeah, too cold. you know, too far, too cold. Yeah. I love the seasons, yeah. but anyway. Um, but yeah, I came back to LA and did my geriatric fellowship, geriatric psychiatry fellowship at UCLA. Um, you know, trained there in ECT and all things geriatric psychiatry. And then um, started my you know practice um, affiliated with Cedars and UCLA, so I still work uh, at UCLA teaching the residents in the geriatric evaluation clinic there, which is really fun. And then um, I also have my private practice where I see patients. Where's your practice? At Cedars. Um, it's located at Cedars um, in the Cedars Sinai Medical Office Towers. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also have a forensics practice, do quite a bit of that kind of work as well, um, you know, involving conservatorship and yep. issues of capacity. So that's really kind of what I do. Nice. We actually had a pod, our previous podcast, with ha- which has not been posted yet. Uh, I had a podcast with a fiduciary and an attorney oh, wow. about conservatorships and things like that. It's a hot we're, topic right now topic. with Brittany and all yeah, of that going on. Big, big thing. So... Yeah, that will eventually be get uh, posted on our website and YouTube and all that stuff. Well, uh, now that we know your background, I would like to discuss uh, and talk uh, about dementia. Absolutely. So dementia is uh, the big umbrella. And under dementia, we have many cognitive impairments. Alzheimer's, which is the biggest one, and vascular dementia, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, can you tell us a little bit? And, and then there's also reversible and Irrever- irreversible dementia? Correct, um, yes. So why don't we kind of educate our uh, listeners or audience a little bit about what dementia is, those who do not know. Um, and so as we progress with this topic, because most of it will be related to dementia, so they know what we're talking about rather than just jumping into it. Absolutely. So, you know, it, it can get a little confusing, but I mean, the basic, you know, um, kind of diagnosis criteria we go by is essentially um, if you have subjective or objective evidence of cognitive impairment. So that's a fancy word for saying if the people around you are seeing something and you yourself are seeing something or so subjective or objective on testing you're not testing the way you should be on a screening test, such as the MOCA or the mini mental status exam. Um, you have some type of cognitive impairment. If you add on what we call functional impairment, so you've got subjective or objective um, evidence of cognitive issues, plus you have what we call functional impairment. So you're no longer able to do things independently, for example, paying taxes, managing your medicines all by yourself, arranging transportation all by yourself, remembering birthdays or anniversaries all by yourself, what we call kind of the independent activities of daily living. So if you're starting to become more dependent in those areas, so you have what we call functional impairment, you can't really do some of the things you were supposed you used to be able to do you're not compensating for that cognitive issue those cognitive issues so cognitive issues plus functional impairment equals dementia so function uh, cognitive issues without functional impairment is what we call mild 
cognitive impairment. The new term is mild neurocognitive disorder. Okay. So essentially, to have a dementia, you must have evidence of cognitive impairment either by reports from people around you or your own observations or a test that shows that you are not performing where you should be plus evidence that it's actually affecting your normal everyday life and your ability to do the things you used to be able to do by yourself. Okay, so now uh, let's take a scenario. I'm going to a bar and I get drunk and I go home and the next day, I don't remember well, half of the stuff that happened anymore because <laughs> I was intoxicated. At the time that I'm intoxicated, am I demented? No, you're not. So basically, this is where we get into reversible versus irreversible causes of cognitive issues. Okay. Um, and substances are huge. I mean, we talk about, you know, how... Um, in the early part of the century, uh, syphilis was this thing that could look like a million different afflictions, right? Mm -hmm. It could look like mental health issues. It could look like cognitive issues. It could look like heart issues. It could look like, you know, abdominal issues, um, neurological issues. So we say that in this day and time, substance use is the syphilis of our time mm. because it can look like anything. So specifically when we're dealing with older adults and cognitive impairment or even younger people in cognitive impairment, you always want to make sure that there's not a reversible substance use issue mm -hmm. that is going on because that can make people not only have memory issues, but focus issues, concentration issues. I can't begin to tell you how many people come in. They say, Dr. Mora, I have the worst ADHD. And I say, no, you just have a drinking problem and then it gets better, right? So, um, you know, again, focus, concentration issues, mood issues, anxiety issues, substance use can cause so many of these things, whether that's marijuana, alcohol, um, or other sort of products that are out there mm. that, are, that people are purchasing or getting by prescription, you know, that happens as well. So in an older adult, when they start having cognitive issues, part of our workup is to make sure that those issues are not reversible. So I'm gonna wanna look at, are they using substances? Does the issue get better when we cut it out? Depression on its own, we call it pseudo-dementia because people can look demented when they have depression in late life. But if you treat the depression, the cognitive issues actually improve significantly. Wow. So making sure there's no depression going on, making sure there's no prescription medications that can contribute, that can contribute or cause cognitive impairment. Mm. Um, that's a huge one, you know. And then there's a variety of other issues, you know, making sure there aren't problems with their thyroid, there aren't problems with vitamin deficiencies that can also make people appear more cognitively impaired. So uh, does... Uh, so, so, okay, somebody's uh, abuse is... Uh alcohol or drugs or anything does that contribute i know so i know that's kind of uh re the reversible kind of dementia but if you use let's say you use this for a long time could that could contribute to the irreversible dementia it's people who absolutely like people who like today i see more and more people uh use cannabis like any any other person, like oh, I need cannabis. Well, I have anxiety. Okay, um, or or alcohol. So because, let's say they start to use this on a chronic, like constantly. Are there are there any studies that show the use of cannabis or alcohol or any other uh, recreational drugs that con can contribute to uh, the, the irreversible dementia? Yes, this is a great question. So um, alcohol plays a role in cognitive issues in many, many ways. So just in you know, what we just talked about, that it can cause excuse me, reversible cognitive issues. If you already have cognitive issues and you're drinking on top of that, it's like a double whammy. I mean, you're going to be way worse than you normally would be. And then there's, of course, what you just brought up. Um, we know for sure that alcohol use on a chronic basis is actually toxic to the brain. And there is a type of dementia that is called alcoholic dementia. Mm. So there's actually dementia 
due to alcoholism and nothing else. So let's let's jump back into our topic of the, the that you mentioned about uh, depression and how that correlates or ties into the dementia. Uh, like when you were saying about uh, when somebody has dementia and you look under uh, in an autopsy that the brain cells look. Yeah, it's almost like a tree that sort of lost its leaves, and you know, so chronic untreated depression is actually really dangerous and toxic for the brain. You know, we always talk about it. it I think it's easy to write off depression because we use it as a word in English mm -hmm. that just means sad. Yep. And so it's like, oh, I feel depressed today. I'm going to go do yoga. I felt better. You know what I mean? But when we're talking about clinical depression. Why don't you give us the definition so audience understand what is formal diagnosis of clinical depression. Absolutely. So clinical depression is a state where you have a certain set of symptoms. It's not just feeling sad. Feeling sad is one of them, mm -hmm. Be but being unable to experience pleasure or enjoyment in things is another. Memory issues and trouble processing information, thinking more slowly, being unable to focus is another symptom of clinical depression moving more slowly, talking more slowly. I don't know if you're getting the gist here, but what we're saying is it affects the body as well as the mind. Um, things like um, suicidal thinking obviously is a symptom of depression. Um, you know, people feeling more socially withdrawn, um, people who, you know, essentially will um, feel like uh, there's really just nothing that they're around for nothing to live for any longer. Um, so there, there are a lot of different symptoms of depression and you have to meet a certain criteria to be diagnosed with it. And it has to be impairing your quality of life. But this is very different from just feeling, feeling sad. sad. So is there right? a time frame? So everything you just mentioned, is it all or none? Or is it some of these symptoms? And if so, if somebody does experience these symptoms that you just described, is there a time frame for these symptoms? Like you have more than a day, more than a week, more than a month that say, so, okay, well, if you just, how long have you been feeling uh, sad or feeling like you cannot process your thoughts? Two days. Oh, no, it's not long enough. Is there a time frame before you can actually formally diagnose somebody with clinical depression? Yeah, usually we say about two weeks or more. Um, we try, and, and also it's more about how it's functionally impairing them. Mm -hmm. Right. So if someone can't, they can have no energy, they can't get out of bed um, and they're suicidal and they're feeling really sad. We used to think, well, it's very dependent. Let's say if someone just died and you're feeling that mm -hmm. way, then we give you a grace period. Got it. But actually you need to bounce back. Yeah, exactly. But actually now we feel that someone passing away in your life is similar to any other stressor. Right? So depression is something where we say the genetics load the gun, the environment pulls the trigger. Mm -hmm. So whether that's moving homes, whether that's the loss of a spouse, whether it's the loss of a job, if you have depressive sim symptoms of clinical depression and it's causing functional impairment, you have a diagnosis of depression, but usually it has to be two weeks or more in terms of how we think about it. If someone's telling you like they felt that way for one day and then it left, you're thinking more about um, reversible causes of depression. So let's say, you know, substance use or other particular things that might have something to do with it, you know, that they're ingesting that mm -hmm. could have something to do with it or, you know, eating disorders, you know, make people feel depressed as they're on this roller coaster of, you know, restricting and then binging, et cetera. Yeah. So is there a way to, so, so somebody, let, let's just say somebody does have clinical depression that does contribute long-term if, if, if it becomes chronic, that does contribute to dementia? Absolutely, and it actually contributes to heart disease too. Really? So And stroke risk. Mm. So if you think about it, you know, if you connect the dots, the way in all of this, the common thing in all of this is inflammation. So depression, chronic depression, is a state of inflammation in the body, in the brain. And that in itself increases risk of stroke, increases risk of vascular disease or progression of vascular disease, increases risk of heart attack, um, increases risk of you know poor health for the neuronal cells so you really want to make sure that that depression is being addressed not necessarily through a medication it might be through therapy um, but certainly that it's getting addressed is important 
So, um, is, are there any promising new drugs that are coming up uh, in in our world here? In, in, with, in pharmaceutical, with all these pharmaceutical companies are trying to come up. With, I, I actually, I heard that there's a new drug that is coming up, or it came out. It's it been came approved by out. FDA. It's been a little controversial. So, it's called Aduhelm. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's A D U H E L M, and mm. the FDA. Um, you know, there were some concerns about this drug because, uh, you know, we felt as though there, a lot of medical professionals felt as though there was not enough data to support its use in Alzheimer's patients or patients with uh, dementia. Um, however, uh, the, the FDA was under a fair amount of pressure. We have really had no drugs come down the pipeline for this disease in a very long time. I mean, we have just basically the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which is Aricept, um, also known as Dinepazil, Galantamine, Rivastigmine, um, also known as the Exelon patch. And then we have Nemenda. And that's pretty much it in terms of, you know, FDA approved And that's been a while since it's been approved. It's been a while. And those medicines, they just slow the, they slow the decline. They don't, um, and they buy you maybe about six months to a year of time at the current level of functioning, but they're not going to reverse anything, right? And so this new medication, it has a very novel mechanism of action that targets the buildup of cer certain proteins in the brain that we think is the cause of Alzheimer's, but there's some data suggesting that it's not necessarily like the, the plaques cause, the plaques, or... exactly. And so basically, um, you know, the FDA moved forward with approval, but now they're retracting or they're saying they're sort of backtracking a little bit and saying they're not taking back approval, but they're saying that this should only be used for people in very early stages, oh. not in later stages. Because, I mean, you know, um, again, the evidence was not super robust and yet they moved forward anyway and making a blanket um, approval for it with for all patients with Alzheimer's but it sounds like we're going to be getting a little bit more information about who we should be using it in um, because no medicine is without risks and you don't want to expose somebody to risks of medication without knowing that there's a lot of benefit so, so that basically there's nothing promising on the horizon at least yeah there's a I lot have. of promising research for sure I mean we have some great um kind of uh uh, research that's going on and also the research on the biomarkers so being able to identify early stage like very very early stages um, we're starting to make a lot of progress there in terms of um, brain scans you know FDG PET scans things like that but unfortunately in this area our ability to diagnose it is far more advanced They're than treated. our ability to treat it yeah. and so we're just trying our best to find out, you know, what we can do, especially the idea is that to treat it, we have to catch people super early and we have to initiate treatment at that point in time. Um, so I, I don't want people to throw up their hands and say, oh my God, there's nothing we can do. I mean, there are things that definitely can be done, especially if people are in this weird gray area of what we call mild neurocognitive disorder, also known as mild, mild cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. or that's the old term for it where there's definitely subjective or objective evidence of cognitive impairment, but it hasn't moved into functional impairment yet, mm. right? So in people in that category, they have a higher risk of progressing to dementia in the next five years. So what we found can be helpful in that period of time in preventing dementia or at least um, mitigating that from coming on is certain really tried and true behaviors. So exercise, exercise, aerobic exercise is one of the few things we know that actually can restore the functioning of neuronal cells. There's nothing else you can do that restores the functioning of neuronal cells. So neurons from, I mean, many, many years ago was when I was back in college, they said neurons, once they die, they do not replenish it but now i hear that it's not true that's not true but the only thing we really know of that can replenish neuronal cells is exercise huh. and it's it's mainly um uh, been seen in the hippocampus so the area that's particularly linked to memory exercise can be very um helpful 
in improving the function or restoring to some degree those neuronal cells. Um, so that's huge. Controlling vascular risk factors. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have um, you know, issues with blood sugar, diabetes, if you have high cholesterol, if you're a smoker, controlling oh, smoking those... smoking is not good for you? <laughs> <laughs> Never knew that. I know. Uh, news just came out. Yeah, you just know. came out. Yes, I just recognize that smoking is not good. Guys, do not smoke. <laughs> exactly. If you're going to do anything else, drink as much Coca-Cola as you want. Don't smoke. That's actually coming um, up, the Coca-Cola coming test. Up, coming up. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, basically if you think about it, your brain, the only way it gets its nutrition, its nutrients, its oxygen is from the vasculature mm -hmm. that supplies it, right? So you want to keep those vessels wide open. Yeah. You don't want anything, you, you know, bring blocking as, them. Bring as much oxygen to the brain as you can. Absolutely. And so, you know, basically prevent buildup in those vessels through stopping smoking, through reducing blood sugar, reducing you know your risk of diabetes if you have diabetes, keeping that glycemic um, control really tight, yeah. super tight, you know, um, making sure that your cholesterol is within limits, uh, normal limits, or lower than that. Um, what about sleep? Getting oh, a sufficient amount of sleep versus sleep, insufficient. Sleep is huge, huge. So, you know, if you think about it, would you ever leave your computer on? and never turn it off. I pretty much do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I know I shouldn't. And you probably had to buy a new one, yeah, I imagine. after a week. <laughs> it's like, uh, dementia. <laughs> so basically, you know, like I said to you, you would never leave your computer on and never shut it down, you know, and let it sort of reboot, clean up, organize its files, etc. Yep. Um, so basically sleep is like shutting down your computer and letting it do updates. Right, it's gonna work faster. It's gonna work more efficiently. It's healthier for the brain to be able to get that rest. And we have seen that in people who have sleep issues, they're not getting enough sleep. They are at much higher risk of dementia later on in life. Wow. So how many how many hours? If you can give us a range, how many hours an individual needs to sleep a night to consider a healthy lifestyle? And also, as I understand, is the older you get, the less you need. Sleep. That's correct. That's correct. So it really depends on the age of the person. You know, um, with older adults, I try to say no less than six hours of sleep. Um, but, you know, some of them. What if you're a teenager like me? <laughs> <laughs> Then you, then you just got up like an hour ago, right? I'm still tired. <laughs> I mean, teenagers, excluding teenagers, I mean, people, you know, who are um, non-geriatric adults, usually you're looking at, you know, trying to get at least seven, seven hours of sleep per night, um, trying to keep it not less than that um, for optimal functioning. And I can't tell you how many patients I have where, you know, they were complaining about focus issues, anxiety issues, um, you know, energy issues. And all we do is we just fix the sleep and we wow. get them enough sleep. And that's it. And that's it. They are cured. Didn't even um, need to write a prescription. So it's really key. Sleep is huge for the brain's health. This is incredible. It's amazing how many, it's, you know, it's much better to work on prevention than cure or treatment you know it's it's just incredible how the little things can make such a big difference in your life with that uh, i want to ask you a question while people are still young and healthy um uh, and i've had in the past residents who were re relatively young uh, that were diagnosed with dementia like uh, huntington dementia yes uh, I know that's a very kind of... An early onset Alzheimer's very, is one. Very, yeah, very, uh, very devastating disease. Devastating. Um, so I wanted to ask you, is there any specific symptoms that, that an individual at any age that should pay attention or seek medical attention should they f experience certain uh, symptoms that could be alarming? And like you said, it's much better to catch something early on 
than later. So is there, are there any specific things in general, not specific, I'm not talking specific in vascular dementia or Alzheimer's, or just in general, anything specific that we should look out for? And if this comes up, so well, you know what, maybe I should go see uh, a doctor. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I think certainly when you're talking about like early onset dementias, which have a high genetic component to them, you know, you're going to want to be obviously getting genetically screened if that, because usually it's like running in the family. But in terms of actual symptoms that, you know, might give you a reason to follow up with a primary care doctor or a neurologist or a psychiatrist, um, anything involving, um, you know, people say, oh, I forgot my keys or I misplaced this or I misplaced that. But usually if you remind them or they see it, they're like, oh yeah, I remember when I left it there. So that ability to retrieve information, um, sometimes as you age can be challenging, but you shouldn't feel like it's completely new, right? So the issue is if you're getting a reminder and you have no recollection so you do of not, that thing. So you do not recall it. You don't recall it at all, uh -huh. even when reminded. Uh -huh. That means you're not encoding information. So to be able to remember something, you have to encode it mm -hmm. And then you have to be able to retrieve it. Uh -huh. As we age with normal age-related cognitive changes, normal, not dementia, um, the retrieval ability gets a little more shaky. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you for you know, you forget what your spouse told you to get at the grocery store. But when you're reminded, you're like, oh, oh yes, yeah. that was yeah, I was supposed to get the toothpaste. You know, yeah. I completely forgot it. Um, it's when you are reminded and you have absolutely no, no recollection. That is when we get very concerned. And we call that an, sort of amnestic events that are happening where you have a complete amnesia mm -hmm. for that particular thing. So that's you know something in mem the memory area that we get a little concerned about, obviously, that would prompt getting help. Um, and then, of course, you know any changes in personality are definitely concerning. So there are certain types of dementias where it's not memory that goes first or short-term recall. Behavior. It's behavior. So this is the guy who used to be super buttoned up and you know uh, very polite, very deferential, who all of a sudden is being inappropriate with a waitress at a restaurant, you know, or making comments that are using you know foul language or curse words that are really odd and off the cuff obviously you want to rule out substance use yes, but yes. <laughs> you know um if that in the absence of substance use if that's happening there's a real personality change um people are seeming more impulsive more disinhibited sexually or otherwise you're gonna want to definitely get consultation with a neurologist or a psychiatrist or just going to see primary care as the first step. Interesting. This is uh, so. What, by the way, what is the earliest that you have encountered, like from your, you know, your experience as a, a geriatric psychiatrist? What's the earliest that you would diagnose an individual, like in terms of age-wise, uh, with dementia? With dementia, yeah. um, you know, usually by the time someone comes to me, it's been Something's happening going. for a little bit of time, but. Um, I think the earliest on the, the earliest I've ever diagnosed somebody has been like 49, 50 years old around there. And that's really more the genetic, uh, genetically determined early onset dementias kind of, especially Alzheimer's dementia can come on in the fi your fifties. Wow. Um, if not a little bit earlier even so. And is it true that, um, the earlier you get dementia, uh, the faster it'll progress? Um, I mean, it, it, it's... I, 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 from my experience, mm -hmm. I'm not a physician, but every time we got a resident, and not, not, not in the 50s, but even in the early 70s, mm -hmm. versus somebody who comes to me, to us, eight, late 80s or 90s, and let's say they come in both with uh, early stage or mild cognitive impairment, we realize that pe th those individuals who come to us in, in the later age, like, like in the 80s, late 80s or 90s, the dementia progresses much slower and usually they die with the disease rather from the disease instead of somebody who comes to us 
in the late 60s, early 70s, and has diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, that thing progresses so fast, and then the complication of the disease, they cannot swallow, they cannot this, and boom, and they die. Mm. So I don't know, that's... Uh, I, I, that's a really I, interesting observation. Yeah. I mean, it's very dependent on the type of dementia that the person has, mm-hmm. right? And then also, I mean, just to be clear, when we say early onset, we mean it's like highly genetically determined and it usually is in the late 40s, 50s. Mm-hmm. So if you're getting it in your 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, that's considered late onset um, dementia, dementia of Alzheimer's type. Mm-hmm. And that also has a genetic um, link, but not as robust, not as strong as the earlier onset folks. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, I hear what you're saying. I mean, it would really be important to understand, was there a vascular, because sometimes there's mixed type. Mm -hmm. So there's Alzheimer's, but then there's also a vascular component. Um, The other thing too, is if you're getting it in your 80s, right? You've been fairly, it it likely means that your brain was fairly um, healthy to begin with. Mm -hmm. Right. So people who are they're more highly educated, they have more brain tissue Mm -hmm. to work with more spare. Yeah. More like they've got the spare tire. Right. right. Um, They're going to be able to um, kind of resist or compensate Mm -hmm. better for the disease. And they likely would go into assisted living or or a nursing home kind Mm -hmm. of environment much later Mm -hmm. because they're able to compensate. Whereas people maybe who are showing signs earlier, there may be something else compounding it. There may be a vascular piece too. There may be, you know, um, like other issues that are contributing that may be leading it to progress a little bit quicker. Also the other piece is when somebody who is, let's say formerly very active, moves into an environment where maybe they're not getting as much stimulation or they're not around, they don't have their job anymore, they don't have their friends necessarily, they tend to decline faster. I know you guys obviously do everything you can we to stimulate, to, to, yes. but But it's never general, like real life. Yeah, it's, it can't ever match like real life, right? So I wonder if that's also a part of it in terms of what you're seeing, but that's a fascinating observation. It is, and, and I actually had a uh, discussion with my nurses, and they said, yeah, that's actually, uh, that's what they have seen, because I have a few nurses that came to work uh, at Rise Paradise uh, from other uh, long-term care facilities, and they claimed the same observation. And I was that's like, interesting. this is very interesting. So I, I don't know if there's any correlation with uh, when it starts and how fast it progresses. But uh, but I think, I think it's very important um, to delay retirement as much as you can. I yes. think waking up in the morning and have a purpose, somehow subconsciously it helps your brain know, oh, I have a responsibility, I have to get up, I have to do that. Versus you get up in the morning and say, well, what am I gonna do, play bingo? Or, you know, I think, yeah. I think subconsciously it's it, it somehow, work. and it doesn't mean you have to do what you do, but you do have to have a purpose in life, regardless Absolutely. of the age. I, I, that's what I think. Like sometimes the weekend comes, and I have a lot of friends and they'll tell me, oh, I can't wait for the weekend. And to me it's like, oh, the weekend comes. Now what am I gonna do? I can't wait for the Monday to come. <laughs> you know, so I think it's really how you look at things, right? So honestly, Moti, like, you know, this point you make about some form of meaning or purpose that we find in our work and in our jobs, um, or if, you know, we're a stay at home mom or whatever, like just even having something that you have to do every day, responsibility to other people and value and feeling needed. And that meaning I think is just, it's almost like this nourishment for the brain. Right. And so, um, we see a lot of people where they age and they retire and then they're just, they really decline after that because there's really not that purpose. So I wish that there could be an organization or, you know, something, maybe you could start this where I love ideas. Basically (laughs) it's like a fake workplace for people with dementia and each person is assessed based on their abilities or like the things they used to like to do or what their work used to be. And it's almost like crafted as a workplace that they have to go to every day you know, and there, you know, there's like a hired actors that are supervisors or that are, you know, employees for that person. And they can just, 
you know, they have their computer or their paperwork or whatever it is, and they can just feel like they're doing something. This is you this know? is actually a really good idea. It would be incredible, and I would I would refer everyone to you. <laughs> so you know, it would just you know, this is recorded on camera, so we have a contract <laughs> now, <laughs> a verbal contract. <laughs> but really, it's so key, you know, because I think retirement plus hearing impairment, visual impairment, it's like the world starts to shrink and people, and the brain needs the world. It needs input from the eyes, from the ears, from the environment. So it's like a muscle, you know, the more you use it, the, the, exactly. the stronger it gets. And, exactly. Yeah. So, well, listen, this is very, very, even for, I mean, I'm listening to you and it's just like, I can go for hours and, you know, uh, maybe I should go to your lectures when you lecture medical students. <laughs> you know, this is very, very informative. You know, that's, after college, that's all I've done. I've been in running facilities and dealing with dementia. So for me, it's like, wow, it's really intriguing and very interesting. So it's really cool. So I, I, I want to thank you for all this very inf uh, informative uh, data that you give us and, and the latest stuff. So... Before we conclude, uh, we had a little uh, thing with my guys here um, about, as we mentioned, diet is very important, right? Diet is very important. So we, we have here uh, Coca-Cola, two different kinds of Coca-Cola. Uh-huh. Uh, one is, uh, I, I, so just, just to let you know, I don't drink soda, never drank soda. Maybe I tried it a few times. But based on, based on my understanding, this is Coca-Cola, an American Coca-Cola, and this is Mexican Coca-Cola. Now, the difference, from my understanding, is that uh, American Coca-Cola has uh, less sugar. Mexican Coca-Cola has more sugar, but it's cane sugar versus a different kind of sugar. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little test. And then I also want to, with that in mind, I also want to talk about Coca-Cola, regular Coca-Cola or regular soda versus diet soda. And I know you had something to say about it. So why don't we try this? Uh, I know I should. Sure. Uh, should I, is it a blind test? Do we're going to close do a, my eyes? We're going to do a blind test. I'm okay. Gonna, I'm going to pour it first and then I'm going to turn it around and All right. see if you can <laughs> tell me which one is which as long as I remember. That sounds good. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to take it over here. So I'll, I'll look away. Yeah, look away. I'm going to turn it around. All right. Go ahead. Try it. Tell All me right. which one you think, and, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to also try it. This is uh, compliments from Vlad, our IT guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is like wine tasting. This is American. This is Mexican. Okay, which one again? This is? American. Mexican Coke. Okay. The verdict is you're wrong. No way. Mexican. American. You're kidding me. Oh my god. I'm so embarrassed. Are you are you are you a Coca-Cola drinker? I am. I love Mexican <laughs> Coke with tacos. You know, we live in LA. You can't Vlad, get, your test didn't pass. Sorry. You can't go to a taco truck and not get a Mexican Coke and now, oh my goodness. Yeah. So the right the, so, How I, embarrassing. so I so I don't get confused the way I did it is that the one on this side is this one, and the one on this side is that one. That's why. Oh my why. goodness! I never would have. But thought. to me, but to me, uh, I don't feel really the difference. But let's really touch quickly on uh, diet soda versus regular soda. I know. Uh, I, I know. First of all, it's not good for me because a lot of sugar causes inflammation, which may cause down in, in your life. Uh, impair your um, or, or contribute to memory um, and insulin resistance insulin is resistance. huge if you've got a bunch of sugar floating around in your bloodstream that your body's not able to bring in um or take up then that in itself is damaging your blood vessels and uh your vasculature and your nerves and i mean all these issues that we see in diabetes are from that per that central issue so how is that, if, if somebody was to say, I'm not giving up soda and I'm going to drink diet soda versus regular soda, what would you recommend? You know, I would say to them, uh, reconsider that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> think about sparkling water and yeah. some, you know, fruit juice or whatever, like low glycemic index, like kind of flavor that kind of goes in there or, you know, 
kombucha or just drink water. Something Water's else. great. Yeah. It's delicious, you know, and healthy. Um, and, healthy. Uh, and there's just so many options in the market now, you know, in terms of these fizzy drinks that have no calories, no sugar, just like a little bit of lemon flavor and some sparkling water. What could you, you know, what could be better than that? But I mean, obviously diet soda like does not have for someone who's diabetic, you know, if it's harm reduction certainly maybe a diet soda would make them more sense if they're going to be drinking a soda at all um but we do know if you're looking at you know weight loss goals or issues with weight loss um you know there's been more recent evidence suggesting that diet soda individuals who drink diet soda are actually they struggle with weight almost even more um or just as much or even more because uh of issues that for for whatever reason it has an impact on satiety and so people tend to get a little bit hungry or we think it might be that people are getting more hungry when they're drinking diet soda we're not sure but you know ultimately the best thing you can do for your health is just drink water (laughs) and exercise (laughs) and exercise and And get your labs in control and sleep it's just the basics right like i think we try to make it really complicated around you know i've got patients families emailing me all the time like should we be changing the Wi-Fi in the house because it's affecting their dementia? Should we be exposing them to this Hertz um, light, you know, light uh, filters? And no, it's not that complicated. It's really straightforward. You know, it's what you watch, what you eat, stay on a Mediterranean mind healthy diet. Don't get diabetes. Stop smoking. Exercise. Drink water, hydrate, and sleep. I get sleep. You know, treat your depression. That's it. Uh, you know, it's really it's that basic. simple. It's I, that I, I, simple. Unless you are predisposed with genetics, then you, it's a little different. Exactly, but you know, if you are predisposed to genetics, do those things to modify your risks. Yeah. Because again, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger, ah. and everything you do with to your body is part of your environment. Right. And stay busy with a purpose. Stay busy. Stay busy. Not as busy as you. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a good <laughs> balance. That's but... a good balance, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you need to go on more hikes on the weekend. There you go. Emoji. There you go. Wait, we went on a hike. It was all right. <laughs> Dr. Moore, I want to uh, thank you very much. I think it was very informative. I hope with all our um, technical difficulties, I think um, overall it, went, it was good. And I think our audience would love it. And they will find this very educational. Great. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, and, it's a pleasure. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be doing another podcast sometimes in the near future. That sounds fantastic. Thank well, you very thanks much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.